Okay. Let's talk about cool animals. <laughs> no coefficients of friction. <laughs> so when we left off, we had just started introducing the definition of predation. Right, so thinking about one organism that's benefiting by consuming tissue, right, and one organism <clears throat> and that is suffering okay, um, by being the consumed. Okay, so that's our formal definition for predator and prey. And so we talked at the end of class about, in the end, the many different ways that you can actually look at these terms being applied and how, particularly with our mammal bias, we tend to use carnivory, right, is our formal definition of predator and prey, right, the lion and the gazelle sort of business, right, a meat eater and the meat as being the predator and prey. Um, but ultimately, there are a lot of different ways that predation is actually still applied. So we talk about herbivory, right? So the animal is the predator and the plant then is the prey, right? Plants are still alive. Their tissues are still consumed. They're the nutrients. So from the kale's perspective, it's still predation. And then we talked about the difference between parasitism and parasitoids, right? So out of all of these, parasitism is really the most chill of all the options. You have the parasite, which is the predator, and the host being the prey. Okay, the host is giving up usually nutrients or sometimes parts of tissues, but it's usually not the goal okay, of the prey, uh, predator or parasite in this case to destroy or kill its host, the prey. Um, because then the parasite is also getting a negative impact, which is unusual. And that differed from the parasitoid, which is the most rare of these four cases, and really kind of the most brutal. Where you have the parasitoid, right, the predator, okay, <laughs> laying its eggs in the prey. It's not actually the next generation until the next generation that we actually see the predation occurring, right, where the eggs then hatch and then consume that tissue. Okay, so when we think about how these things um, work together, okay, we can start to look at diet. And we can start to see, too, how this overlaps with some of our previous conversations about trophic structure. Okay. So if we think about car carnivores, okay, animals that eat other animals, okay, or organisms that tend to find themselves up further, in the trophic structure, right, secondary or tertiary, sometimes quaternary consumers, okay, these organisms have to have broad diets. Okay. By broad diets, we tend to mean that they eat a larger variety of organisms. Okay, so it's unlikely that they're going to specialize and eat only one thing. So if we think about something like a wolf, okay, we can start to list all of the different things that a wolf would eat as prey. Okay, pretty much anything it can catch. And that's usually the rule when we're thinking about a predator, right? Elite bunnies, they'll take down <laughs> small birds, they'll take down other weaker wolves, right? They'll take down deer, they'll take down elk, they'll take down. So whatever it is, right, if they can take it, they'll chase down caribou. 
that's kind of the benefit of pack hunting. They don't even have to take down things that are smaller than they are. If they can catch it, they will eat it. Conversely, many herbivores have fairly narrow diets, or more narrow. Giraffes just pretty much eat only the acacia bush. Every day. We were just joking about this. Okay. Monarch butterflies, right, they're caterpillars, the form that eats food, only eat milkweed. Now it's not always that narrow. Okay, but oftentimes herbivores only eat a handful of things. Okay, certain types of grasses. Things that are accessible to them. Things that their mouth parts fit well. Now, there's a couple of reasons for this. You can have a more specialized mouth part. But also, if we think back, we're going to dig up some dust, right? And two things like our tertiary and quaternary consumers, okay, remember those energetic transfers. Okay? So when you're at the top of the pyramid, you're not getting as much energy okay, from whatever it is that you've caught. So oftentimes these organisms are less picky then about what they're getting. Okay, our herbivores are much lower down on our pyramid. Okay, the energy transfer is much better. The energy efficiency is much better, right? Okay, so they can be pickier because they're getting better energy transfer from their food source. There's a few other things to consider when we consider why these things might be happening. If we consider the carnivore, most of the time, when a carnivore attacks its prey, it lights out for their prey item. This is a high-risk situation. Okay, the wolf goes for the rabbit. And you don't just take a bite out of the rabbit, and then the rabbit goes about its day. Even if they don't finish the meal, right, the bear takes the salmon and only eats part of the salmon, which is common, okay, the salmon doesn't get to swim away with whatever's left of its body. It's done ski. Okay, so carnivores pretty much always kill their prey. Okay. Conversely, most of the time, at least when you're thinking about a one-on-one -on -one interaction, herbivores don't always kill their prey. They do sometimes, right? Rabbit on dandelion, <laughs> that dandelion is doomed. Okay? But caterpillar on milkweed, that milkweed plant's going to be fine. It's going to eat like a leaf. Okay? The giraffe eating the acacia tree, it's going to eat some of the leaves. Going to damage that plant, okay, but it's not going to kill the whole tree. Okay, so herbivores do not always kill the plants they eat. Okay, so if we think about this from our last unit, the relationship between population abundances, okay, if carnivores only ate one prey item, you run a much higher risk of wiping out the only food resource you're going to eat. And that sounds like a pretty big problem. Okay? So it's helpful then okay, if you widen the amount of things you're going to eat. Okay, so you always have a wide population abundance to eat from. For herbivores, because you don't tend to decimate 
your food resource, right? I'm just eating a little bit of the tissue. I'm just gonna eat a few fingers today. Right, some of your leaves. It's not as big of a deal if I only eat that one thing. They'll grow back. It's not really a thing you can make an analogy for animals, but let's talk, let's work with it, right? Uh, the other thing we want to think about here is abundance and mobility. So the animals can move, and so they're hard to find. So if I'm a carnivore looking for animal predators, we call this search image. We talked about this a little bit in Zoe, if you took Zoe with me. Right? Optimal foraging strategy, how quickly can you find a prey? Right? If I'm only looking and only going to eat rabbits, okay, those rabbits can run from me and they can hide from me. It can be very difficult then for me to find food, particularly if they're scarce, particularly if it's winter, if they're good at it. I might starve to death just looking for that one thing because I'm not very good at it. Okay, so if I have several different types of food that I'm willing to find, then my ability to find food then increases, right? Okay. If I'm a herbivore, the acacia bush is still there, man. Like I just have to know where it is and go get it every day. Okay. My life is significantly easier. It can't run from me. It can't hide from me. As long as I can overcome its thorns, it's good. I can just walk around and sort of laugh at all the, the carnivores, like, struggling. The other thing to think about is that plants are often more abundant. Okay. Again, we want to think about some of these trophic abundance things. There's more trees and grasses than there are squirrels. And most plants have faster growth rates. I cut the grass, it goes back way too fast. Okay, I cut down a squirrel, won't be until next year that there are more baby squirrels. Okay, so it's much easier to focus on one type of thing. I only eat grass. Well, that grass will be back much quicker. Now, sometimes, depending on the food source, that may mean you need to eat more. Okay, the energy content from it is good, but sometimes some of the other contents in it are not. And this is why you see things like elephants and hippos have to eat like their own body weight per day. Okay, because things like calcium is really low, nitrogen is really low. Okay. Certain essential amino acids can be really low in certain food resources, or you'd have to travel long distances to find types of grasses or types of plants that have these things in them. So if you're eating just plants or just one type or two types of plants, you have to be very cognizant. This is something we see pandas deal with, because they only eat bamboo, which has like fundamentally no nutritional value. So they don't like do anything because they have like zero energy to expend so they have to eat like a crap tonnery of the shoots and leaves to try to replace the fact that it has like no nitrogen calcium and phosphorus <laughs> so it can be done if you have this very like minimalistic diet but some food sources are going to be better than others whereas meat despite the fact it has a small energy transfer has already accumulated all of these different things in it. So it tends to be better for having all of the different nutrients already in it. Right, you know that your body has a good variety of calcium and phosphorus and potassium in it, right? Because you've worked hard to make sure that you're healthy. Most of us. So that's what this graph is showing us, right? We see things like animals versus parts of tree. The xylem and the phloem are like the main parts of trees. So we're looking in this case at nitrogen. So 
so a main nutrient that we would want. Okay, so we see here that most animals, right, we forget insects are animals, are very high in nitrogen. Well, we're well-rounded. Okay, some plants are as well. Like I said, not all plants stink at what they do. But some plants are doing a pretty bad job. So if I was eating just tree bark, and there are animals that do this because yum. Or remember we talked a couple weeks ago about like what do deer eat in the winter when someone made a joke about how terrible it is to live in Maine, Natalie. Okay, so remember deer tend to eat things like tree bark in the winter. So they would really struggle to get things like nitrogen in their diet, and they would need to either supplement that or they would be going through a deficiency because there is so little. Okay, any questions about this? See what we all the different pieces, moving parts there are about diet here. Okay, so we can see how like this is wrapping up a whole bunch of our previous units kind of together. Okay, so things like search image. So we've talked about this before. If you've taken Zo very lightly with me, so I want to revisit this. So optimal foraging okay, basically deals with what is the best place or way or food type okay, for you depending on your diet. Okay, and so there's a lot of things that go into this beyond just am I a carnivore, am I a herbivore. Okay, so we already sort of Nudged, sorry guys. We already nudged this idea of encounter rate. And we talked that this is kind of part of how problematic it can be to be a carnivore. Okay. AKA, how likely are you to run into whatever prey item we were talking about? So the example we were using is if I was hunting rabbits, okay, how likely am I to actually see? Okay, find that search image of that rabbit. Okay, are they speedy? Are they hiding? Are there a lot of them? Okay, so all of those things together create my encounter rate. Okay, so if it's really high, then I can be more specialized. Okay, I can focus on that rabbit. But the lower it is, okay, the more generalist I would want to be. Right, the more other food types that I would want to start incorporating into my diet or start to get. Okay. There's pretty much no carnivore that is 100% exclusive. There are some very tight relationships no exclusivity and not in the same way that you see like panda and bamboo which by the way is also a terrible idea okay so encounter rate we kind of already get right we started building up this idea previously the other thing that we want to talk about is handling time in other words how hard is it to eat the thing okay, so this is Really easy to picture when we start thinking about things like shellfish. Right, so it may, for example, be very easy to find and collect like a clam. Okay, there's holes in the ground. They're pretty easy to see, particularly at low tide. Right, I can walk out, clam diggers, stick a pole in the ground, dig them out. Okay, there's a bajillion of them, particularly if I know where to go. No problem. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. This came from Maine, right? So, 
spent a lot of time on the coast. This is not a problem for me. That being said, now what? Right? Opening and eating a clam, or right, the shucking of a clam, is a whole different business. Okay? This is handling time. So what is the amount of time that you're going to spend actually getting the food out of the organism? And so there's a lot of people I know that won't eat like crab and lobster because they say it's too much work, right? Some of you are nodding like, yeah, okay, not going to bother with this. Why order crab if I can eat a cheeseburger and be done eating before you've eaten two legs, right? Yeah, okay. So this is the idea of handling time. And animals have the same problem. Okay? To get the same amount of nutritional value, how much energy am I putting into getting stuff out of here. Okay, and this works for all sorts of organisms. And it gets even worse if whatever you're getting out of there isn't worth it. Okay, so if I open this teeny tiny clam and there's only like a tiny bit of meat in there, man, <laughs> what a waste of time and energy. And now I'm still hungry. Same thing for some plants. If I have to spend all this time maneuvering around giant thorns or huge poisonous bits okay, to get this teeny tiny leaf or these leaves that are not very nutritious, I have to work through breaking down, breaking down this bark, okay, like a xylem and phloem. I have to work on breaking down this bark, and I'm going to get what? That diddly or nutrients out of it. So that's a lot of handling time. Get very little out of it. So as we think about this, oftentimes, particularly with carnivores, they may show a preference. So a really classic example I have in this last uh, box, and we'll end up talking about that when we talk about competition and things like that as well, right? So the lynx, right, that kind of furry big cat, a little tail, go after hair. They like them the best. They're also really good at catching them. So even if hares okay, are a little low in abundance, they're still more likely to go after them. So that's a preference. I have a favorite food type. Okay, but they're still not specialists. Okay. They won't only eat hares. They won't turn down other food if it's present. If they still eat rodents, they still eat small birds. And most of the time, we see what's going on in this right box, more common. Most predators just pick what's most accessible, what we call prey switching. What is the most abundant or easiest to get? Okay, so in this example, right, the guppy is our predator. So if we give the guppy two different choices of food, okay, they just pick whatever is the most abundant, the most obvious food choice. So if I put two chip bowls in front of you, you're just going to pick out of whatever chip bowl is the most full. Okay, and when one chip bowl gets kind of empty, you'll switch to the more full chip bowl. And this is pretty common behavior, right? If you imagine going out and hunting, Whatever prey type is most abundant is also going to be the easiest to catch. You're going to have the highest encounter rate. So then you'll spend the least amount of time actually hunting, actually looking for prey. Less time digging for chips, more time eating chips.
अगर So as we mentioned, most herbivores are still specialists. Okay. And that's because eating plants is still its own deal. Right. Actually breaking down that plant, cutting that plant, right, and consuming that plant, breaking down all its parts, is still a separate issue. So, okay, as we think about what part of the plant are we actually eating, most of the time we're eating just the stuff that's above ground. Roots are kind of uncommon, unless you're something like a mole or a worm. Even from there, okay, as you think of the whole plant organism, most commonly we're still... only going to eat the leaves and not the stem because the stem is really dense. Okay. It doesn't tend to have a lot of nutrition because most of the time the stem is just there to move water around. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really thick. It has a lot of heavy polysaccharides in it that are really hard to break down. There's usually only a few specialized organisms that are good at it. And bacteria, termites, stuff like that. It's really hard to eat. And most of the nutrients aren't there, right? They get passed through there, but they're stored in the leaves. So it's not worth going to all this trouble to break it down, right? We want to think about handling time. We're going to spend all this time breaking down the stem, and we're going to get very little nutritional factor out of it. Right? None of the water is stored there, none of the nutrients are stored there. It's just passing through. It's like a highway. The leaves are still usually the most common part. Okay, so eating the stems, eating the bark, these are like emergency situations. Okay, high competition situations. Migration type situations. Okay, there is literally nothing else. There's too much snow. There aren't any leaves. I have to tough it out for a while kind of thing. Okay, so most of the time we see that herbivores are feeding on just a few different plant species. So they have mouth parts that are set up to break down a specific type okay, of leaf, okay, as well as um, body digestive systems that are set up to deal with certain type of plants. Because okay, plants also have defensive systems. They have spikes and thorns and all sorts of toxins. And so you can't be set up to defend against everything, so you're going to be set up to defend against a handful. And just like we saw with some of our previous units, it also helps with competition. Okay, so let's focus on our graph here. What's my graph telling me here? Excuse me. Okay, so my bottom here is species eaten. Right, my top is number of the species. Okay. So how am I making the connection between this? What's my take home message here? So how would I interpret this point? Mm -hmm. 
And do I have a lot or a few plants? So I have a lot of plants. So many plants are eaten here. Do I have a lot or a few species? A few, right? So this tells me that very few species, of very few fly things, eat many plants. this box out of the way. Everybody see that? Oh, we got that with that? Let's try it the other way then. What if I wanted to look at let's put color too. one of these early points? You got it, Kaylee. Right, so these ones are saying that most or many flies, species, right, eat little variety. It's a high school variety. Or pretty much, right, just one or two types of plants, right? So these guys are very loyal to their plant types, right? They're going to lay their eggs under a very specific type of leaf. They're going to breed around very specific types of plants. And their mouth parts fit or pierce a very specific type. So they're going to be most competitive on a few species. That's where they're going to hang out. That's where they're going to live. Okay, great job. Any questions about this? Okay, any questions about any of the diet that we've built up to this stage? All right, let's look at some capture and avoidance techniques. Okay, so we're going to talk about predators. We have to talk about prey sort of simultaneously um, because most of the time, if you are a predator, you are also a prey, right? There are very few sort of keystone, top of the food chain, food chain individuals. So you are a predator when you're eating other individuals, right? So our rabbit is a predator when it eats the lettuce, right? But then it is also a prey as it's running from the wolf. Most organisms have techniques to capture, and they also have techniques to avoid being captured. So, animals eat and avoid being eaten. And these are some high-risk situations. So, we want to think of these as two different ways they can go about things. And they often have both. Okay, morphological, Okay. Physical traits that they can use to either capture or flee, and behavioral the ways that they can behave or interact. So morphological might be like longer legs, okay, to run, okay, sharper teeth, they okay, have better killing bites. Behavioral, it might be being better at hiding, being more cautious, okay, so I'm less likely to encounter a predator. 
or it might be a better stalking behavior. I'm keeping lower to the ground. I approach my prey slower. Okay. And there's a variety of ways that we go about this, and we'll talk about a ton, right? And in general, how you go about doing things also matter. Okay. So we think about how am I actually going to get my food? Right. So I have a variety of examples up here. We have active hunting, the way we think about like wolves and lions. <clears throat> We have the ambush predators. And I'm going to hang out and wait for you to stumble upon me. Our classic kind of couch potato. Okay, and then we have the trappers. And we have spiders that do this in webs, spiders that dig holes. Plants do this. We think it might have been like a pitcher plant or a Venus flytrap kind of business. So let's stop here. So on Friday, we will discuss several specific examples of types of capture and avoidance. Um, and that's going to serve as a really good sounding block as we start to think about your red